Hello and welcome to the first week of class. In this lecture, we're going to talk about lesson one, uh, which covers uh, chapter one and chapter three, respectively. Um, as you can see, um, we'll talk about management risk and information systems. That's actually the book. Uh, we'll talk about lesson one, risk management fundamentals, <clears throat> excuse me, compliance law, standards, and best practices. So let's get started. So our learning objectives uh, for this lesson is uh, to explain the basic concepts of and need a risk management organization. And we'll also identify uh, compliance law standards, best practices, and policies of risk management. And our key concepts, uh, we'll be able to define risk, uh, balancing risk, the seven domains of a typical IT infrastructure. <clears throat> And I want you to pay particular attention um, once we get to that section of uh, the seven domains of a typical IT infrastructure. Um, you know, basically you have the user, uh, the land, the land to WAN. Um, you have a system application, um, just to name a couple of those that we'll touch on and uh, that will tie closely uh, back to your lab that you'll have to, uh, to address. And so then we'll... Uh, address the confidentiality, integrity, and availability. A lot of people call that the, the CIA triad. You will hear me refer to that quite a bit in this, uh, in this course. Um, uh, so anyway, the CIA triad is not a central intelligence agency by any means, um, but it does mean confidentiality, integrity, and availability. We'll touch on compliance laws and regulations and, um, you know, basically the United States Risk Management Initiative. Um, we'll also look at the standards and guidelines uh, used for compliance. And many of you have, have probably seen some of those. Um, so chapter one, risk management fundamentals. Just as anything, um, in building a house, uh, you know, basically you have to have a, a strong foundation. Um, and so if you don't have the strong foundation, um, then your house could fall, settle, um, you know, cause a lot of damage later on, in the, in, you know, for the, in, the, in the future. So why pay all that money and not do it right? So we're going to talk about... Um, the risk management fundamentals. And I want to start out with a quote uh, from, um, and, and some of you may have heard this uh, through your lessons before. Um, The quote comes from uh, the Chinese general Sun Tzu. Uh, Sun Tzu Wu uh, wrote uh, The Art of War. It's a military uh, treatise uh, that emphasizes the importance of knowing yourself as well as the threats you face. And this was around uh, 500 BC. I think that was a little bit before some of, some of us were born. So he goes on to say, therefore I say, one who knows the enemy and knows himself will not be in danger in a hundred battles. One who does not know the enemy but knows himself will sometimes win, sometimes lose. One who does not know the enemy and does not know himself will be in danger in every battle. So basically, to protect your organization's information, you must, one, know yourself, that is, be familiar with the information assets uh, to be protected in the system's mechanisms, methods, uh, used to store, transport, process, and protect them. And secondly, know the threats you face. To make sound decisions about information security, management must be informed about the various threats to an organization's people, application data, and information systems. As illustrated, um, you know, basically, a, a threat represents a potential risk. Um, 
to an information asset, whereas an attack represents an ongoing act against the asset uh, that result that would actually result in the loss. Uh, threats uh, is basically damage um, an organization's information or physical assets by using exploits uh, to take advantage of a vulnerability where controls are not present or no longer effective. Unlike threats, which are always present, attacks exist only when a specific act may cause a loss. For example, uh, the threat of damage from a thunderstorm is present throughout the summer in many places. But an attack and its associated risk of loss exist only for the duration of an actual thunderstorm. The following sections uh, that we'll talk about um, in this chapter, uh, especially chapter one, um, is we'll see the, the risk, threat, the vulnerability, and we'll talk about loss, and then there, there's two types of loss, tangible and intangible. Tangible is measurable and intangible is not. And so um, we'll touch on some of these um, you know, basically risk the likelihood that a loss will occur. Losses occur when a threat exposes a vulnerability. And basically a threat is an activity that presents a possible danger. Just because it's a threat doesn't mean it's going to happen, but you need to prepare for that. A vulnerability is simply a weakness. And so um, a loss um, in a compromised business functions or assets And as I mentioned, uh, can be um, as tangible or intangible. So, what are some of the compromises uh, to business functions? Um, let's say, for instance, uh, salespeople regularly call or email customers. If the capabilities of either uh, phones or emails are reduced, sales are reduced. A website sells products on the internet. If the website is attacked and fails, then sales are lost. Assets can have both tangible and intangible values. The tangible value is the actual cost of the asset. The intangible value is value that cannot be measured by cost such as client confidence, generally acceptable accounting principles, the GAAP, uh, refer to client confidence as goodwill. Imagine that your company sells products via website. The website earns $5,000 an hour in revenue. Now imagine that the web server hosting the website fails and is down for two hours. The cost to repair it is a total of $1,000. So what is the tangible loss? So let's look, the lost revenue is $5,000 uh, times two because we're down to two hours equals $10,000. The repair cost is $1,000. So your total tangible uh, measurable value is $11,000 for the website being down. The one thing that makes it intangible is to know uh, it's not easy to calculate um, how many people what have visited your site during those times and how many possible loss of uh, sales uh, that you that you would have lost during those two hours. So those are things that you cannot measure unless you um, keep uh, good metrics and, and uh, data. Um, let's say for instance the website went down on Tuesday from 1 to 3 right after lunch and so you can go back to your records and say well normally on Tuesdays from 1 to 3 that's when people go to lunch or come back from lunch and you know they're doing some kind of shopping or browsing around and that's when our sales equal x amount of dollars during this x amount of time and so you can somewhat measure that <clears throat> based on history and so but you know then you may uh, you know come into a holiday season or a special occasion that that would have uh, had more traffic during that time <clears throat>
So profitability, profitability uh, versus survivability. The uh, profitability is the ability of a company to make a profit. Profitability is calculated as revenues minus cost. And then, of course, survivability is the ability of a company to survive loss due to a risk. Some losses, such as a uh, as fire, uh, can be disastrous and cause the business to fail. Um, in terms of profitability, a loss uh, can ruin a business. In terms of in terms of survivability, a loss may cause a company never to earn a profit. The costs associated with risk management don't contribute directly to revenue gains. Instead, these costs help to ensure that a company can continue to operate even if it occurs, or even if it incurs a loss. When considering profitability and survivability, uh, you would want to consider the following items, out-of-pocket cost, lost opportunity cost, uh, future cost, and client stakeholder confidence. Of course, we all know um, all of those things factor into whether you make a profit or not. And, uh, and you know, too much out-of-pocket cost, uh, you're not making a profit, so why stay open? The lost opportunity cost, uh, let's say, for instance, your website's down for two hours, and um, just as we mentioned, and uh, those customers that, that normally would have bought from you during those two hours have uh, went to another website, another company, that, that sells the same product and, and now they have bought from there. So one, you've lost your customer. And so two, now you have to find new customers. It's easier to retain customers and, and manage those retained customers than it would be to um, go out and find new business. So uh, those are lost opportunity costs and, and a lot of that's uh, measured through intangibles. Um, so your future costs. You know, basically, the, the countermeasures require ongoing or future costs. The cost could be for, um, for renewing hardware or software. Future costs can also include the cost of employees uh, to implement the countermeasures. And, of course, the clients and the stakeholder confidence. You know, so basically, can you keep your customers and your stakeholders that are your investors mainly, uh, do they have confidence in you? And so, uh, if you don't have that, then your business isn't going to survive. All right, so the seven domains of a typical IT infrastructure, as we mentioned earlier, um, this was something that we were going to touch on, um, and, and especially uh, you, will, you will find this throughout um, the duration of this course. Uh, we'll refer back to the seven domains of a typical IT infrastructure. So if, if, you, if you can, um, or if you will, um, write down each one of the, the seven domains as you see on the, on the screen here, uh, the user domain, you know, the workstation domain, the LAN domain, LAN to WAN domain, remote access domain, the WAN domain, and the system application domain. So you have all of these <coughs> that make up the IT infrastructure. So if you can, I would write these things down and see, um, as we talk about these, what, what, what is actually associated with these domains. And obviously, like the user domain and um, like workstation, these are common sense names, so you can sort of put two and two together. Like for instance, the user domain includes people. You know, they're users, employees, contractors, or consultants. Um, you know, basically the old phrase uh, that a chain is only strong as its weakest link applies to IT security. Too. So uh, people are often the weakest link in IT security. So hence the user domain, uh, especially when uh, they can give up passwords or compromise passwords by uh, writing them down and sticking them to the monitor. Or, you know, sometimes they're not less um, they're less blatant than that. So they actually stick them to the bottom of the keyboard, which is also a big no-no. So. Users, uh, you know, tend to visit risky websites and download an executable um, and effective software and, or execute infective software. Um, they may bring a, a virus in from home with a thumb drive or uh, different things. So anyway, the, that is probably your, your biggest weakness in IT infrastructure is the people. Workstation domain. 
The workstation is the end user's computer. The workstation is susceptible to malicious software, also known as malware. Um, if antivirus software isn't installed, the workstation is vulnerable. The workstation is also vulnerable if it is not kept up to date with uh, recent patches. And so some malware infects a single system and while others uh, release worm, uh, worm components that can spread across the network. Um, I can remember uh, working for the DOD as a systems administrator, and uh, some of you may may or may not be old enough to to remember the uh, Melissa virus, um, where it's like, please read, um, and, and so it infected hundreds of computers, and literally hundreds of computers that had to be rebuilt from scratch. And so you're talking about a lot of overtime and um, a lot of a lot of time spent rebuilding folks' systems because they clicked on a, a Word document that had a macro built in that um, infected not only their system but everybody on the email list. And you see how it goes, and, and then to that list, and to that list, and to that list. Um, so essentially, it, it spread like wildfire. So. Now let's talk about the land domain. The land domain is the area that is inside the firewall. It can be um, a few systems connected together in a small office or a home office, or it can be a network with thousands of computers. Each individual device on the network must be protected or all devices can be at risk. Um, network devices such as hubs, switches, and routers are used to connect the systems together in a large area network, uh, which is like we say, is the land. The internal land is generally considered a trusted zone because you know you're basically going from inner office to inner office, um, you know, from one computer to the next without having to leave your organization, um, literally with a router or, or you know go through a firewall. So basically, everything is behind the firewall and it is in house. And so, um, data transfer within the land isn't protected as thoroughly as it, uh, if it was uh, sent outside. Of the land. So, an example um, sniffing attacks occur when an attacker uses a protocol analyzer to capture data packets. A protocol analyzer is also known as a sniffer. An experienced attacker can read the actual data within these packets. When hubs are used instead of switches, there's an increased risk of sniffing attacks. An attacker can plug it into any port in the building and potentially capture vulnerable data. When switches are used instead of hubs, the attacker must have physical access to the switch to capture the same amount of data. Most organizations protect network, network devices in server rooms or wiring closets that only certain people have access to. So let's talk about the LAN to WAN domain. The LAN to WAN domain connects the local area network to the wide area network. The land domain is considered a trusted zone because it is controlled by a company. The WAN domain is considered an untrusted zone because it is not controlled and is and is accessible by attackers. The area between the trusted and untrusted zone is protected with one or more firewalls. This is also called the boundary or the edge. And so, in this course, you will you will hear these terms. Um, you know. Uh, boundary devices or edge devices and so that's what it's basically um, talking about with um, you know with the firewalls and, and the equipment to to maintain that firewall and so basically when we say boundary or edge it's also referred to as boundary edge uh, boundary protection or edge protection the public side of the boundary is often connected to the internet and has public IP, which is Internet Protocol addresses, these IP addresses are acceptable, accessible from anywhere in the world, and attackers are constantly probing public IP addresses. They look for vulnerabilities, and when one is found, they pounce. Because of this, the Internet is an untrusted zone. A high level of security is required to keep the land to WAN domain safe. Let's go to the remote access. Uh, this one's uh, somewhat of a touchy one. Um, I can remember uh, certifying products uh, with the DOD, especially tactical systems, for uh, systems that went to overseas to uh, to help uh, 
our war fighters, um, the system that we had, um, you could have one central system and you could have child systems. So you have the parent system and the child systems. But, you know, the parent system had to remote into the child systems, even though they were set up the same. There was a whole different accreditation just for remote access. And a lot of paperwork, a lot of time, a lot of security to increase. And so, uh, but remote access does um, have the potential of, of having a, uh, a large risk. And so, uh, basically, you know, mobile workers often need access to the private land uh, when they're away from uh, the company. So, remote access is used to grant mobile workers this access. And so, if you're sitting in a hotel room, whether it's a Hampton, Holiday Inn, uh, Marriott, um, whatever your favorite chain is, insert there. Um, you're using their public Wi-Fi, which is a public internet address. You don't know the, the security of that. So basically, you're on their Wi-Fi and with a public IP address, and so you're ex susceptible uh, to an attacker during that time. So in order, in order to access your, your local LAN uh, back at the office, a VPN uh, would need to be established, which is a virtual private network. And basically, um, it provides access to a private network over a public network. So the public network uh, used by VPNs is most commonly the internet. Since the internet is largely untrusted and has known attackers, remote access represents a risk. Attackers can access unprotected connections. They can also try to break into uh, remote access servers. Uh, using a VPN as an example of a control to lessen the risk. But VPNs have their vulnerabilities as well. So two vulnerabilities that apply to uh, VPNs is, uh, you know, basically the authentication is when the user provides um, credentials to prove their identity. If these credentials can be discovered, the attacker can later use them uh, to in impersonate the user. The second stage is when uh, data is passed between the user and the server. If the data is sent unclear, or basically send in clear text, an attacker can capture and read the data essentially with no effort. So it's a, a you know, basically the, the VPN uh, establishes a tunnel uh, for the connection, um, but you also need to have encapsulation and um, encryption uh, to help protect that data. You don't want to send in clear text, you want it to be encrypted. And so let's move on to the WAN domain. For many businesses, the WAN is the internet. However, a business can also lease semi-private lines from private telecommunications companies. These lines are semi-private because they are rarely leased and used by only a single company. Instead, they are shared with other companies. As mentioned in the LAN to WAN domain section, the internet is an untrusted zone. Any host on the internet with a public IP address is at a significant high risk of attack. So a significant amount of security is required to keep host uh, in the in the WAN domain safe. And as you can see um, right up here the WAN domain um, there's a many of you recognize those devices. The system application domain uh, refers to servers uh, that host server level applications like uh, email servers that receive and send email from clients. Uh, database servers, uh, host databases that are accessed by users, applications, or other other servers, uh, DNS servers, uh, domain name system, uh, which are servers provide names to the IP address for clients. You should always protect servers uh, using uh, best practices. You know, for instance, uh, change the default passwords. Um, and, and one of the things is uh, working as a systems administrator, uh, setting up servers. Uh, you know, you disable the the, the guest account. You also disable the, um, any unneeded services because any of those services can serve as a back door for any attacker. And so usually, uh, you know, people that, that work on these uh, is basically, uh, it becomes a challenge uh, for people that work on these uh, servers in the system application domain is that the knowledge is is, is specialized. You have to have training for that and certain certifications. Uh, so, uh, 
some of you may be familiar with the DOD 8570, and a lot of times people with server access would have to have a level three uh, technical uh, certification, you know, some well known as the CISSP um, certification. Um, so, anyway, let's move on to the next slide here. The CIA, no, not the Central Intelligence Agency, but it's the Confidentiality, Integrity, and Availability. So, confidentiality is basically preventing unauthorized disclosure of information. Um, data should be available only to authorized users. Loss of confidentiality occurs when data is accessed, accessed by uh, someone who should not have access to it. Data is protected using access controls and encryption technologies. And integrity is ensuring that the data or an IT system is not modified or destroyed. And so basically what, what uh, how they verify the integrity is they using uh, they use a method called hashing. Um, that's to ensure the integrity of the data. And so availability that's ensuring the data and services are available when needed. IT systems are commonly protected using fault uh, tolerance and redundancies um, techniques. Backups are used to ensure the data is retained even if an entire building is destroyed. And so if either one of these uh, go down, you have an impact. Um, you know, a vulnerability is a weakness. Um, it could be a procedural, technical, or administrative weakness. It could be a weakness in physical security, technical security, or operational security. Just as all threats don't result in a loss, all vulnerabilities don't result in a loss. It's only when an attacker is able to exploit the vulnerability that a loss to an asset occurs. So survivability and balancing the risk uh, and cost. You know, every organization needs to consider the cost to implement a control and the cost of not implementing the control. And so uh, you weigh your, your good and your bad and, uh, you know, is it cost effective or um, will this cause other things to become non-functional, uh, which means you have to modify other things. And so, um, you know, spending money to manage a risk rarely adds profit. Uh, we know that. Important uh, point is that spending money on risk management can help ensure a business's uh, uh, survivability. And so, if you can stop a, uh, a threat from uh, from happening, um, then is is it worth it? I would say yes. The cost to manage a risk must be balanced against the impact value. And so. Um, So let's look at the impact value. The charge is pretty self-explanatory. So let's say the, the high-level threat uh, likelihood 100%, 1.0. If you look at the low impact 10, medium impact 50, high impact 100. So it's basically uh, 10 times 1 equals 10. You know how that works. Uh, that's for high-level threats. And the higher the number, the, the greater the threat. Let's talk about the role-based um, perceptions of risk. You see management at the top, and you know management is, um, you know, they're concerned with profitability and survivability. But um, basically, the buck stops stops with them. Um, they hire people underneath them uh, that may have more IT security and IT um, uh, background well, with information security uh, than they do, and uh, they trust those people for advice and. Uh, 
what they need to spend and what they don't need to spend, and um, what what controls uh, to implement versus the ones not. And of course, we, we talked about the profitability and the survivability and how you balance that. Uh, but ultimately, when it comes down to the company, uh, senior level leadership is ultimately responsible. So. As you see, systems administrators, those are the um, specialized folks that, that work on the email servers, the domain servers, the, the web servers, uh, those have a, a particular specialty or expertise uh, to operate those. Tier one administrators is more like your uh, help desk type uh, persons, like when someone calls and they can reset a password, you know, with simple functions. I know there's more, more to uh, help desk uh, personnel than that. I used to work at help desk uh, many years ago and so um, we were more of a, I, I guess the section that I was in, we were more of a tier two which uh, involved more um, advanced troubleshooting and that kind of stuff. Um, and so you know basically you know you, then you have your developers, you know some organizations have their own in-house application developers. Uh, they write applications that can be used in-house or sold. Um, and then obviously you have the end user. Um, if you're an employee, then obviously you're uh, you're a worker bee. You're the end user. And so basically, the risk identification process, um, as we mentioned earlier from the quote, um, you must know yourself and you must know your enemy. Uh, you need to identify the threats within your organization, identify the vulnerabilities, and then you want to estimate the likelihood of a threat exploiting a vulnerability. The loss of confidentiality is basically when someone sees your password or company's secret formula. The loss of integrity, uh, for instance, is an email message is modified in transit. A virus infects the file or someone makes unauthorized changes to a website. The loss of availability is an email server is down uh, and no one has email access or a file server is down so data files aren't available. Um, and you and I know very well that um, in this electronic um, day and age where everything is passed digitally um, we, we, we somehow um, think we can't survive without email. If the email's down for half a day, then um, you know we, we can't we can't perform our work. But um, that's happened uh, in three or four of the places that I've worked um, in organizations that I supported. Um, I'm like, why can't you just pick up the phone and call somebody and talk with them? So anyway, I won't go down that rabbit trail. So a threat identification is the process of creating a list of threats. Uh, the list attempts to identify all the possible threats to an organization. This is no small task. The list can be extensive. Threats are often considered in the following categories, external or internal. You have natural or man-made, intentional or accidental. And so your threats, external, internal, natural, man-made, in, uh, intentional or accidental. Your vulnerabilities, um, you know, basically your audits, certification, accreditation records, system logs, prior events. Trouble reports, incident report, uh, incident response teams. And you'll probably hear me say this during the semester uh, in other lectures. Uh, you know, basically, uh, the techniques of risk management, uh, you know, avoidance. Uh, what, what can we do to avoid the risk? Acceptance is how much, how much are we willing to accept? Or which risk are we willing to accept over others? Uh, Cost-benefit analysis later on in the in the text um, and in later lessons, 
um, in your labs, you will you will address the cost benefit analysis, um, residual risk, um, you know those things um, all exist. So. So we're going to take a small break, and um, I'll come back and finish up uh, with Chapter 3 when we talk about managing compliance. So we'll be back in just one moment. All right, so that was uh, Chapter 1, so now we'll jump into Chapter 3, Managing Compliance. Um, maybe you're awake after that first uh, chapter's lecture, so I'll try to keep you awake during this one. Um, Compliance, uh, managing compliance. Uh, this is a tough one. Um, a lot of regulations to cover, um, and some of you are familiar with them. The FISMA, which is the Federal Information uh, Security Management Act, and you'll hear me refer to this one quite a bit because you know out of that um, you have the risk management framework, uh, which is known as the RMF, um, that that came out of uh, that one. Uh, the DOD uses that as their framework to um, protect their systems. Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, HIPAA, you know when you go into a doctor's office you have to sign a form and you can elect to say okay I want my wife or I want my friend or um, my cousin's best friend's dog um, to have access to my medical records. And so if their name's not on there they're not getting access to the records or they should not have access to those. Uh, the Graham-Leach uh, Bliley Act, um, GLBA, you'll hear the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, which is SOX, uh, SOX, Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, FERPA, that applies to, to you and I. Um, I cannot give your uh, records out without your consent, um, or neither can the university give your records um, out to anyone without your consent. So the Children's Internet Protection Act, CIPA. And so basically within any modern society, individuals elect to trade uh, some aspects of personal freedom for social order. Um, I believe it was um, Jean Jacques uh, Rousseau, Rousseau um, explained in the, the social contract or principles of political right in 1762, uh, basically laws are the rules that members of a society create to balance an individual's right to self-determination with the needs of the whole. Laws are rules adop adopted and enforced by governments to codify expected behavior in modern society. They're largely drawn from the ethics of a culture which defines, so, uh, defines socially acceptable behaviors that conform to the widely held principles of the members of the society. The key difference between law and ethics is that law carries the sanction of a governing authority and ethics do not. Ethics in turn are based on um, cultural mores which are relatively fixed moral attitudes or customs of a social uh, societal group. Uh, some ethics are thought to be universal, for example, murder, theft, and, and, and assault are actions that deviate from ethical and legal codes in most, if not all, the world's cultures. So basically as a future, go back a slide here. Um, as a future um, inf information uh, security professional, um, you'll be able you'll be required uh, to understand the scope of an organization's legal and ethical responsibilities. Uh, information security professional uh, should play an important role in an organization's approach to controlling liability and privacy. Uh, and security risk. In the modern litigation societies uh, of the world, sometimes laws are enforced in civil courts excuse me for that um, so, where was, so let's go back. Uh, the information security professional uh, should play an important role in an organization's approach to controlling liability 
Um, and uh, for privacy and security risk. In the modern uh, lit uh, litig uh, litigious um, societies of the world, sometimes laws are enforced in civil courts um, and plaintiffs uh, and plaintiffs uh, are awarded large payments for damages or punishment or you know, basically to punish defendants. Um, to minimize these legal uh, liabilities, uh, you know, the, the information security practitioner uh, must understand the legal environment and keep appraised, uh, or keep apprised of the of the new laws and regulations, and ethical issues as they emerge. And you know, basically, by educating the employees and management about their legal and ethical obligation uh, and the proper uh, use of information technology and information security, security professionals can keep their organizations focused on their primary objectives. Beyond that, uh, the information security professional has a unique position uh, within the organization. Each is trusted with one uh, of the most valuable assets the organization has, its information. Not only are these professionals responsible for protecting the information, they are privy to the secrets and structures of the systems that store, transmit, and use and protect that information. Thus, they are, the, they are individuals who must be beyond reproach with the highest ethical and moral standards um, bear with me just one moment here Yeah, so basically the, the Roman poet um, Juvenal, in his work, uh, Satire 6, asked, um, who, will watch the, who will watch the watchman, basically, is what he, what he wrote. And this expression has gained unique meaning uh, with the information security community. And, information, and as information security professionals, above all else, understand the challenges and need for accountability. Uh, partly for this reason, it is not yet uh, the industry standard for organizations to hire new employees directly into information security positions uh, <clears throat> unless they have established experience um, at other organizations where they have proven, uh, have basically have, have proven their trustworthiness. Uh, while the standard may change in years to come, most organizations still expect new hires to prove themselves uh, worthy of the responsibility associated <clears throat> with a high uh, trust role. So uh, therefore it's uh, imperative uh, for you to understand and take uh, to heart uh, this expectation of trust. Uh, the expectation of being beyond ethical reproach as you continue your professional journey in information security. So, uh, the U.S. compliance laws and their applicability. <clears throat> FISMA obviously uh, applies to federal agencies. Uh, HIPAA, any organization handling medical data. The GLBA, uh, the Graham Leach Bliley Act, <clears throat> uh, pertains to banks, brokerage companies, and insurance companies. FERPA, we mentioned earlier, inst uh, educational institutions. The CIPA, which is the Child Internet uh, Protection Act. Um, schools and uh, libraries using um, E-rate discounts. Excuse me. Um, So basically in the HIPAA compliance process, uh, they cover organizations that handle health data, medical facilities, insurance companies, any company with a health plan if employees handle um, health data. So that one's uh, pretty self-explanatory. <clears throat> Mm 
The U.S. Compliance Regulatory Agencies, the, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, no, that is not the Southeastern South Conference. Um, although a lot of money comes to their school to the, when it comes to football season anyway. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, as you can see, the, the Federal Trade Commission here in the slide uh, covers uh, several agencies uh, that, that have a broad scope with them as well. The U.S. Compliance Regulatory Agencies, um, if you've done any type of banking um, here in the U.S., you hear of the FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance uh, Corporation, and um, basically um, insures your money up to a certain amount um, so that way you're not a total loss if, if, if the banks or something were to collapse. Um, Department of Homeland Security, DHS, um, State Attorney General, AG, U.S. Attorney General, USAG. Um, organizational policies uh, for compliance, fiduciary uh, responsibility, and the um, fiduciary, um, you know, refers to a relationship of trust. Um, could be a person who was trusted to hold someone else's assets. Um, <clears throat> and of course, a trusted person has the responsibility to act in the other person's best interest and avoid conflicts of interest. I don't know about you, but there's not many people that you can trust with $100,000 these days, right? Um, Okay, let's move on to a couple of slides I want to uh, skip. So the uh, standards and guidelines for compliance, the PCI DSS, if you use a credit card of any type, you will uh, pay close attention to this one. It's the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standards. It's basically a set of standards um, that was developed um, uh, by the large credit card companies, um, you know, basically to, uh, is, is basically uh, required for merchants using specific credit cards. Um, several standards and guidelines exist that can be used to assess and improve security. Most of these standards are optional. However, some are mandatory for certain sectors. Uh, like I mentioned, the, the, um, the PCI DSS is mandatory for credit card uh, merchants. You see the NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. The GA ISP is the Generally Accepted Information Security Principles. COVID, um, as you'll see, uh, there's some videos uh, that I've put out there too uh, beyond the lecture uh, that talks about the COVID framework, uh, which is basically control objectives for information and related technologies. The ISO is the International Organization for Standardization. The IEC is the International Electrotechnical Commission. And the ITIL, I-T-I-L, is the Information Technology Infrastructure Library. And then you have the CMMI. You'll hear me mention this uh, somewhat throughout this, uh, the term as well, which is the Capability Maturity Model Integration. And one of my favorites, uh, Risk Management Framework, is the DOD. But before they went to the risk management framework, uh, they had what they called DICAP, D-I-A-C-A-P, which is the Department of Defense um, Information Assurance Certification Accreditation Process. Talking about your red tape and bureaucracy, there it is. Um, so let's talk specifically about the, the payment card um, industry. Uh, PCI DSS, uh, basically it's an international security standard 
the purposes uh, of the PCI DSS is to, uh, PCI DSS is to enhance security of uh, credit card data. It was created by the PCI standard uh, PCI Security Standards Council with input from several major credit card companies, and and these companies include American Express, Discover Financial Services, JCB International, Mastercard uh, Worldwide, uh, Visa. Uh, and so the goal um, is to th is basically to uh, thwart uh, theft of credit card data. Fraud can occur if a thief gets certain data. The key pieces of data are name, credit card number, expiration date, and the, and the security code. As many of us would call that as the PIN number. So basically the theft becomes really easy um, if, if the thief has um, all of this information. And so, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, this data is often transmitted to and from the merchant. It can travel wirelessly from point of sale machines. It travels from the merchant's computer to an approval authority. It can be intercepted at any time uh, it's transmitted. It can be easily read if it's not encrypted. And so one of the things uh, uh, many of you probably heard about the target breach back in 2012, I think is what it was, um, where a lot of debit card and credit card information was stolen. The only saving grace uh, that, that, that helped target was that the PIN numbers that were used were encrypted. So basically the, the thieves and hackers, they, all they had was credit card numbers. So you really can't do anything with it without the PIN number. So they just sort of had useless data. <clears throat> So the, B, the PCI DSS is built around six principles. Each of these principles has one or two requirements. Uh, the principles and requirements are <clears throat> build and maintain a secure network, protect cardholder data, maintain a vulnerability management program, implement strong access control measures, and regularly monitor and test networks maintain an information security policy. So basically merchants using the credit cards are required to comply with the PCI DSS. Compliance is monitored uh, by the acquirer. Uh, this is the company that authenticates the transactions. Compliance with these uh, PCI DSS is a three-step continuous process. This process is shown in figure um, in 3.3 of your book um, on page um, 71. You basically um, assess, remediate, and report. And of course, the process is repeated several times. Now, the NIST, um, National Institute of Standards and Technologies, um, get up here catch up on my slides a little bit so we're not ready for that slide just yet so let's stay back here on this one um, but we'll cover the the National Institute of Standards and Technologies uh, it's basically a division of the US Department of Commerce the mission of NIST is to promote U.S. innovation and uh, competitiveness. NIST holds, uh, hosts the Information Technology Library, the ITL. Um, the ITL uh, develops standards and guidelines related to it. And um, a lot of times when you go to the NIST, you'll see um, their titles SP. Uh, which is uh, SP 800-30, which means a guide for conducting, uh, which is basically the, the is conducting the uh, risk assessments, is valuable when studying risk management. So SP stands for special publication. Um, and so the one that I referred to, the SP 800-30, uh, which would be a good guide for you guys to read uh, during this course, um, it's, it's quite lengthy, but it, it's well worth the read. Um, 
it basically has the introduction, um, like most papers, uh, it's a short chapter that identifies the objectives and gives some references. But it talks about the fundamentals, um, the importance of risk assessment. It includes definitions for many risk terms. It also presents some models used to assess risk. And then it gives you the process. Um, identify relevant threat sources, um, identify potential threat events related um, to threat sources, um, and so on and so on. Um, the generally accepted information security principles, the GASSP, the GASP, was created in 1992. Uh, GAISP, as we mentioned earlier, was an update to the GASSP. Um, GASP version 3 was released in August of 03. It was adopted by the um, Information Systems Security Association, the ISSA. However, GAISP is no longer mentioned in the ISSA website. Additionally, the GAISP.org website is no longer maintained. But it includes two major sections the GAISP does. It's the pervasive principles and broad functional principles. Um, so that's all we'll cover on that one. So now let's talk about the uh, the seven COVID enablers. Um, those are the videos that I have down there uh, lined, uh, outlined for you to uh, watch. Um, it's about 30 minutes worth of videos. There's about uh, 13 altogether. They're short videos, uh, but it, it, it defines each step in the process and they do a whole lot better job than I do. Um, but basically the control objectives for information and related technology. COBIT is a set of good practices. It applies to IT management and IT governance. IT governance, which is also known as ITG, refers to the process that ensures IT resources are enabling the organization to achieve its goals. Further, ITG, uh, or, you know, basically the IT governance process processes help ensure the effectiveness and efficiency of those resources. COBIT helps link business goals with IT goals. The IT Governance Institute, ITGI, worked with ISACA. Um, that used to stand for something, the ISACA, but they strictly go by their name now. They've dropped the acronym. And so, uh, or the words associated with the acronym, they've dropped it, so they strictly go by SACA. ISACA, I-S-A-C-A, -A, was previously known as the Information Systems Audit and Control Association. So now uh, it only uses the acronym. Um, and so basically, uh, for their on their website, uh, you can find out uh, COVID uh, resources at http colon slash slash www.isaca.org slash COVID slash pages slash default. Um, the overall goal of COVID-5 is to get the most value from IT assets. Um, as you can see, the, the first enabler is principles, policies, and frameworks. Uh, these translate desired behavior into practical guidance. The second step, you know, basically the, well, the second enabler is the processes. Uh, these are the practices uh, and activities performed within an organization. Uh, processes help an organization reach its IT related goals. And third, the organizational structures. This refers to the in, um, entities making the key decisions. Many organizations define uh, these in uh, organizational charts. And then you, uh, number four, the culture, ethics, and behavior. It's basically success uh, depends on these factors. Uh, these include individuals and their entire organization. Number five, you have information, which is organizations rely on accurate information. This is true for both operations and governance. Number six, you have service infrastructure and applications. And those are organizations uh, basically rely on the IT processing and service providers by these elements. And so, uh, finally, uh, last but not least, is the people, skills, and competencies. Successful completion of activities is dependent on these enablers. Um,
<clears throat> There's your um, ITIL life cycle, ITIL life cycle phases, service strategy, service design, service transition, service operation, uh, continual service improvement. The CMMI, uh, yeah, this is a good one here. So the capability maturity model integration um, is a process improvements approach to management. Um, it uses different levels to determine the maturity of a process. CMMI can be used in three primary areas of interest product and service development, service establishment management and delivery, and product and service um, acquisition. So basically the, the, the capability maturity model is designed specifically to integrate an organization's process improvements activities across disciplines. Um, a practical introduction to uh, integrated process improvement provides a, con a concise introduction to the CMMI uh, product suite. Um, so as you see at the different levels there of um, of the CMMI, level zero is non-existent. That's basically security controls are not in place. Uh, that's not a good thing. Uh, there's no recognition of a need uh, for security. Level one is, is the initial stage. Uh, this is sometimes referred to as ad hoc or as needed. Risks are considered after a threat exploits a vulnerability. You don't want to be at this level. Uh, level two managed. Uh, the organization uh, recognizes risk. The organization recognizes a need for security. Um, however, it performs controls out of intuition rather than from detailed plans, responses of reactive. That's not a good level either. Um, level three, defined. The organization has security policies in place. It has some security awareness. Action is proactive. And, and now we're starting to get to the higher level where you want to be. Level four, uh, quantitative, quantitative, excuse me, quantitatively managed. The organization measures and controls security processes. It has formal policies and standards in place. It performs regular risk assessments and vulnerability assessments. Level four is acceptable um, for most uh, any organization. Level five, optimized. The organization has formal security processes in place. Throughout the organization, it monitors security on a continuous basis. It fo its focus is on process improvement. Level five uh, shows the highest level of maturity. So that's where you want to be. So now we're talking about the risk management framework, the RMF for Department of Defense Information uh, Technology. So basically, as we mentioned, the DICAP, uh, which is the old uh, accreditation and certi uh, certification and accreditation process uh, to risk management framework for DOT, basically they, they transferred over, migrated in uh, March of 2014, and I was in the mix of that. Uh, process and it was not a smooth transition by any means um, but but I do prefer the risk management framework over the, the die cap process any day um, basically the risk management framework has the following capabilities it promotes the concept of near real-time risk management and ongoing information system authorization through the implementation of robust continuous monitoring process and so if we go back um, on the slide here, and we're talking about the CMMI uh, process, um, level five. 
optimized. The organization has formal security processes in place throughout the organization. It monitors security on a continuous basis. So you see the, similar, uh, the similarity there uh, with RMF would meet that uh, process. Um, so the risk management profit uh, is an ongoing information system authorization through the implementation of robust continuous uh, monitoring processes encourages the use of automation to provide senior leaders the necessary information to make cost-effective risk-based decisions with regard to the organizational information system supporting their core missions and uh, business functions. Risk management framework uh, integrates information security into the enterprise architect and system development life cycle. It also provides emphasis on the selection, implementation, assessment, and monitoring um, of security controls and the authorization of information systems. As you can see, um, uh, and basically the, the risk management framework uh, links a risk management process at the information system level uh, to risk management process at the organizational level uh, through a, a risk executive, which is basically a function. It establishes responsibility and accountability for security controls deployed within the organizational information systems and inherited by those systems, and a lot of those are known as common controls. Um, so the RMF process um, Uh, basically changed the traditional uh, focus of certification and accredit accreditation as a static procedural activity to a more dynamic approach that provides the capability to more effectively manage information system um, related security risk in uh, highly diverse environments of complex and sophisticated cyber threats, um, ever increasing system vulnerabilities and rapidly changing missions. Basically, the, the risk management framework operates primarily at uh, tier three in the risk management hierarchy, uh, but can also have interaction as tiers one and two, providing feedback from ongoing authorization decisions uh, to the risk executive, which is the function, dissemination, and updated. So tier one is your organization, that's the governance side. Um, tier two, is basically uh, the mission uh, business process, which is information and information flow. And tier three is the information system, that's the environment of the operations. So as you see here, um, you have uh, six basic steps uh, for the risk management framework. And you have um, Step one is to categorize systems. Uh, this is basically where uh, the information system and the information process stored and transmitted by that system based on an impact analysis. Select security control. And you'll hear, um, you'll hear the word baselining uh, throughout this semester too. Um, so select security controls is, a, is basically an initial set of uh, baseline controls for the information systems based on the security categorization, category, categorization excuse me, I'm all tongue-tied today, uh, tailoring and uh, supplementing the uh, security control baseline is needed uh, based on an organizational assessment of risk and local conditions. So basically a risk management framework uh, it is, is more local than it is broad um, uh, versus the die cap. Uh, die cap was more of a broad DOD. Risk management framework can be tailored to the organization as it meets its needs. So implement security controls. Uh, this is um, basically describes how the controls are employed within the information systems and its environment of operation. Assess security controls. Um, this is uh, using appropriate assessment procedures to determine uh, the extent 
of which the controls are implemented correctly, operating as intended and producing the desired outcome with uh, respect to meeting the security requirements for the system. Authorize the system is, uh, is based on the determination of the risk to organizational operations and assets, individuals, other organizations, and the, uh, and the nation resulting from the operation of the information system and the decision uh, that this risk is acceptable. And finally, the monitor security controls um, in the information system uh, is, is, is on an ongoing basis, including assessing control effectiveness, documenting changes to the, to the system or its environment of operation, conducting security impact analysis of the associated changes, and reporting the security state um, of the system uh, to designated organizational officials. Um, while the tasks that make up all the elements of the RMF are discussed, um, or, or as we will, we will discuss, step four, um, assess, and step five, authorize, have replaced the CNA approach previously used for federal information systems, like I mentioned, as the die cap. Um, so I probably didn't mean to spend as much time on the, the risk management framework, um, but I have extensive experience um, in with the risk management framework because I spent long hours, many hours writing documents and uh, justifying risk and, and controls on, on our uh, uh, systems that went to support the warfighter, um, very secure systems. So hopefully you've um, you've learned uh, from lesson one, uh, you know, defining risk, balancing risk, and as I mentioned, um, I would go back and, and look at the seven domains of a typical IT infrastructure. Uh, those you will see often throughout the semester. So I would make myself a little chart if I were you, um, list each one of the domains, and do a little research on your own, and and find out uh, what 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 type of um, scenarios fall within each one of those domains. You will see that on some of your labs that you'll have to work with. And, and some of them are, can cross over domains. They can have the uh, same, uh, a lot of similarities and a lot of characteristics. So, um, so basically they, it's, it's kind of like a Venn diagram where they can, they can overlap each other um, to say. so. We've addressed uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Any information security professional will need to know this. Um, I know the three simple definitions, but that's what all of our information security is based on. It's protecting the confidentiality, integrity, and availability in the organization and the data. So we talked about the compliance laws and regulations. Um, uh, then we've talked about the U.S. Risk Management Initiatives, um, standards, guidelines, uh, used for compliance. So we talked about those, the PCI DSS, um, COVID. Um, we mentioned, you know, a bunch of those things. So um, very interesting read in this chapter. Um, a, lot of good, a lot of good reading. So um, I wish you good luck in this lesson. And if you have any questions, um, uh, please do not hesitate to uh, contact me. Um, I'm here to help. I'm here to facilitate your learning and uh, also provide you with personal experiences that I've had over the past 20 something years working with a DOD either as a contractor or as a, as a uh, civil servant. Um, so um, I have a vast knowledge in that area and so um, and of course you know I have a master's in cybersecurity. Uh, which covers a lot of this information um, that, that you guys um, have just um, covered in the first couple of chapters. Um, so anyway, good luck. If you need me, give me a shout.